we have this saying at our church. It's called broken people, getting healed, loving God, finding purpose. And when I first got that from God, I wrote it down. I was like, no, it just needs to be three things because preachers think in threes, you know. And so it's supposed to be broken people, getting healed, finding purpose. That sounded a lot better to me. But God was like, don't leave out the most important thing. But loving God just seems sort of like an ambiguous sort of phrase to me. It didn't really make clear sense to me. But what he was saying is, he was saying that when you find yourself loving God, you've matured in your love and you've grown into perfect love. It's easy to love people that love you. But when you begin to get into a place where you love God and he's loving through you and you can see all people the way God sees them and you can allow that love to go through you, you're growing in your Christian faith. You're growing in your love. Who are we to allow these things that are in the world, these, you know, the, these silly prejudices that are in the world, who are we to allow those to come into the church when we know God took down every barrier? There is no difference between me and anyone else that ever steps foot in this church. There's no difference between you and anyone else. No one is more than and no one is less than. We are all the same in Christ. I've said it many times. The, the world's way is us and them. You know, the Americans against the Russians or the, uh, the Japanese against the Chinese or the Koreans against the Japanese. It's a, there's all these divisions in the world. It's always us and them in the world. It's not that way in the church. It's not that way in the kingdom of God. In the church, it's us and him. There's no us in them anywhere. Anytime we see that mentality come into the church, we're allowing the spirits of the world to come into the church and bring something in here that's not supposed to be here. It's just not the way God wants it to be. You come to Jesus, you're set free from slavery, and you don't have to carry your cross. If you want to be a disciple, you've got to learn to die to yourself. If you're going to be a disciple, you've got to learn to prioritize your life. Jesus was very clear on that. But you don't have to. You can be saved and not be a disciple. Some of you are like, Phew, good, I want to live for myself. <laughs> my, my money's mine. I love my kids more than anything. Don't ask me to move, God. I can't. Jesus is not Lord of your life. He's just your Savior. There's a Lord and a Savior. It's possible to be saved and not be discipled. But I think you're going to find as we go through this, you might want to be discipled. It means a learner. I learned. How'd you learn? I learned from Jesus. What'd you learn? I learned how to treat people that are different than me. I learned how to not be judgmental. I learned how not to be religious. I've been learning. I'm becoming a disciple. We're going to get into God's Word this morning. We're going to get into something about God's Word that um, I love. And uh, it's going to be talking about God's perspective this morning. You know, God's perspective. When I was a young man and I was first saved... I used to think that uh, it was all about getting the Bible and that this was God's instruction book and that God gave me this Bible to answer. In fact, I've heard it preached. He has an answer for every single thing you're going through. You know, all you have to do is read the Word, and it's in there. It's literally in there. This is the instruction manual. God created you, and this is the owner's manual. Heard that so many times. You've probably heard that too. And as I grew in the Lord, I began to see that it doesn't always work that way. Now, you may disagree with me. I'm, I'm just saying that when you approach the Bible literally, sometimes you can get deceived. Sometimes you can be led astray. Only because when we approach it literally uh, and we think that it's just, you know, God said it, I believe it, uh, I agree with it, I'm going to live it, and that's going to be it, sometimes we, we can do things a little bit the wrong way. You know, I remember, I remember hearing a sermon years ago, several sermons, about the Song of Solomon. You ever heard sermon? You don't hear me preach out of it much because I really don't get it that well. But I heard a guy preach one time. He said, this is the love language. God's teaching you a love language for you to use with your spouse. You know? So I thought, okay, I can literally believe this. And so, you know, I looked in Wendy's eyes and I said, your navel is as, as a rounded as a goblet. And your waist, it's a heap of wheat. 
<laughs> your neck is like an ivory tower. And then I says, are you in the mood? And then, you know, it was like, she said, what, what? You know, I mean, it's like when we approach things literally, we lose it, you know? Uh, it's like, I don't, let me just talk to you about this. This is about God's perspective. If you approach the word knowing that it's God wants us to understand his perspective. That's what the word of God does. You don't approach the word of God as a textbook or as an owner's manual. You approach it as something that's going to give you a perspective that you wouldn't otherwise have. God sees things we don't see. God sees things differently than we do. God's attitude about things is different. When you read God's word and you begin to glean through the spirit of God, he begins to change your attitude about things. You begin to see things from a godly perspective. You see people in a different way. You don't take the literal thing and just put it on people or pound the people into submission with it. That's a literal approach that does not work. He's wanting your heart. He's wanting your mind. He's wanting your attitudes. That's what God works on. So God's perspective, it's his way of seeing things. It's an attitude. You know, Jesus gave us a clear command to love God and to love people. And from God's vantage point, he said, that is the most important thing you can do. Now, from our vantage point, we think there's a lot of other things that really are more important than loving God and loving people. In fact, I've heard people kind of diss on it. I, I heard it last week, and it's like, all you need is love, and this person spent a long time talking about, no, that's not all you need. But according to God's vantage point, God's perspective, he looks down and says, love is the most important thing we, as his children, can do and learn to do. And we have some learning to do about love. God's perspective, it's different. It's different. But we have to line up with that. And so when God says, love God and love people, I kind of want to know what he expects because I look at, I think, okay, what, what does it mean to love God? You just have, I know when I'm worshiping, sometimes I do get kind of tingly feelings and fuzzy feelings and like, oh, I really love you, God. And I can become very grateful and I can become caught up in the moment. But is that really what God's meaning by love God? That you see him and you go, man, he's awesome. And what about loving people? Do you have to feel that, I don't know, that loving feeling every time you know i just i look at lindell and i just i just love you lindell i don't ever feel that but i do love lindell but i'm glad i don't feel that so let's just make a commitment to love like god loves let's make a commitment to know his perspective on having a loving heart let's understand that when we say we love someone that that means that we're prepared to give of ourselves, of our time. That we're, we're willing to sit down and not be a critic, but to be a student and to learn from someone else's perspective. To try to understand rather than just to try to judge and demand that they get what they deserve. It's time that we grew up in love and got away from this, this judgment that we've been tagged with because it's not who we are. And we don't want to be that anymore. The world doesn't need that. I can promise you one thing, that there will not be a great harvest because we put religious demands on the, on the world. There won't be a great harvest. The only great harvest will come when we show people that God really is love and we are loved too, and that people can walk through without being fearful of being put in a marginalized position. We're called to love and to love just like God loves one thing that I'm really thankful for is I heard this week that the skinny jeans fashion is going out of style. So I'm getting... It's going back to cargo jeans. That's what, I mean, really. You know, stovepipe. That's what we need. I can rotate my stock in my closet. Yeah, you live long enough. Hang on to those clothes because they always come back. Don't get rid of them. And I'm going to go one more place. And since it's the day of favorites for me, I'm going to talk about my favorite story in the Bible, which is the parable of the prodigal son. And I'm going to end here, sort of end here, 
I have a little bit of another ending, but y'all just <laughs> bear with me. I made this mistake the first time around. I'll try to be more honest this time. <laughs> Parable of the prodigal son. My favorite story. I think because it just has so many layers of truth in it. And I don't think there's another place in the Bible, this is Luke 15, I don't think there's another place in the Bible where the, the, the results of the spirit of religion can be more clearly seen than in the parable of the prodigal son. And I won't read it. I'll just tell it. Father had two sons. Younger son said he wanted to get his half of the inheritance. And the father split the inheritance, gave it to the older and to the younger son. The younger son said, well, I'm going to go out and sow my oats, and I'm going to go out and find my life or whatever, find myself. And he goes out and he squanders all that money that he got from his dad on riotous living, prodigal living, which and if you look in the Greek, it means being drunk and sleeping with prostitutes. That's what it meant. He spent all his money on that. And then wouldn't you know it, when he was broke, things are not going his way, a famine hits the land. Isn't that funny how sometimes <laughs> things just don't go your way? You know why they're not going your way is because you're on the wrong way. <laughs> and so this famine hits the land. He's like, oh, man. So he goes and he finds this guy that will hire him. And the only job the guy has is to feed pigs. So the guy's out there and he's feeding pigs. And he's, he's, so, he's starving to death and he's, he's feeding the pigs. And he says, you know, even this pig slop looks good because I'm starving. And then it says, he came to himself. Like, what am I doing? He said, what am I doing? He said, my father's servants have plenty to eat. I'll, I'll just go home to my father and ask him if I can be a servant. And here's what he says. He says, he, he, said, he started practicing a speech. You know, this is that part of uh, what you've heard about, you know, confessing to the Lord and confessing in the right way. Oh, you've got to say a certain, you've got to do penance for your sin, or you've got to say things a certain way. He was rehearsing his speech that he was going to tell God. And he says, you know, Father, I've sinned both against both you and heaven, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Take me on as a hired servant. He said, that's a good speech. So now I'm ready to go home. So it says he went home, and he's returning to his father, and he's got this speech all prepared, because he's like a lot of y'all, like a lot of us, whatever. I'm not going to just say y'all, us, whatever. He's going home because he's expecting the father to be pretty upset. He thinks, I'm going to be walking into the deal, and he's, he's saying, I, I hope my dad doesn't just shoot me when I walk through the gate. He's saying, he, he's treating the father like a lot of people try to treat God. Like when they come before God, they're coming before an angry God. But this is Jesus describing the father. And he says when he saw him a long ways off because he was sitting on the porch looking for his son, he said when he saw his son, he ran to him and put his arms around him. Now let this be a lesson to you. The spirit of religion tells you God's mad at you and you can't come home until you get it together. And I'm telling you, that is a lie. Your father loves you. He's looking for you to come home. He wants you to come home. And when you come home, you'll get the same reception this guy got. He'll come, and then, it's so funny, this younger son starts to say his speech. He says, uh, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And before he could even get it out of his mouth about being a servant, the father interrupts him and says, bring out the coat, bring out the ring, bring out the sandals. My son was dead. He's now alive. Bring the fatted calf. We're going to celebrate and have a party. That's what he said. He didn't even get to say his speech. You know why? God doesn't expect any speeches. He just expects your heart to come home and believe that he's a good father and believe that you're accepted because you're a son, not because you're good. Well, I was saying all these things I'm thankful for, and I, uh, I'm also thankful for being able to talk about my favorite subject today, which is, man, y'all are better than the... Nine o'clock crowd. <laughs> it's grace. Yeah, grace. And people say, don't you ever talk about anything else? What's well, hard for me to not... Yeah, I read this book, and I'm, and I'm bound to stay in this Word. That's what God has for me to do. And so when I read from Genesis to Revelation, and it's about grace, I preach on grace a lot. You know, I, I'm really thankful for God's grace, because I've had a lot of opportunity in my life to experience God's grace. And if you've been like that, it's hard to talk about anything else. Thank you, John. That's right. God is good. 
And that's more than just a, that's more than just a saying. And when that becomes real to you, you, you don't have any trouble praising God. 